Hi, welcome to the show with Jerry and Counterpoint. Today, uh, I'll be your host. Tyler, my name is Tyler Kesky. And on the show, we have James Just from the Libertarian Party of Sacramento, and we also have uh, Jason McFay, uh, Mc- McPhee, sorry, uh, who is an engineer from the state of California. I also want to bring your attention to the Big Day of Giving. Today is the Big Day of Giving, and if you visit bigdayofgiving.org, we want you to go ahead and look up Access Sacramento and donate. That way you can keep this channel uh, live and running. So first on our topic, I want to bring up some questions about uh, informed consent. Now, what informed consent is the something that a doctor must must inform means that a doctor must inform you uh, what they're giving you um, prior before they do perform any you know medical operations and stuff. Uh, but a lot of times we have things like vaccines, which people aren't really informed of what's in these things. Do you guys think that that somehow violates that uh, medical ethics and stuff? What are you guys' thoughts? Well, I know certainly you can go to the CDC website and you can Mm -hmm. find out what some of the risks are. I don't know if that tells you necessarily what everything is in Mm -hmm. the vaccine, but um, they they certainly do mention what some of the risks are. But um, otherwise, um, you know, yeah, it does seem like we're often uh, being asked to take a, um, you know, large mix of of, uh, different, um, you know, vaccinations at the Mm -hmm. same time. And Certainly, there's been a lot of good from vaccines in the past. So, uh, but it does beg the question as as time progresses, if we you know keep adding more and more things to the mix, you know, is there? But um, yeah, anyways. Oh, it's a, it, for me. It's a bit of a deeper question. Is does the, anybody have the right to force you to inject a foreign substance in, into your body or to control what goes on inside yeah. your body? No, man, that's a good question. Is mandatory? Is should vaccines be mandatory? I, I certainly do believe that they, they definitely have you know, rid us of a lot of uh, diseases in the past. Um, but it, it, is it an ethical question? Do you guys think it, it's it's ethical to uh, force everyone to t- uh, have to be vaccinated, um, or is it ethical? Is it not ethical because? and what's not vaccinated i mean and that, does that put our, our society in danger what, i mean what, what is the libertarian perspective or what are your guys personal thoughts on that i for for me i i think the way i'd much rather go on this is to see uh the effects of of, of competition on this area i mean mm-hmm. you could certainly have businesses that said you know we only allow people who come in here who have show their vaccination card or or some uh, you know mm-hmm. piece of information like that that would show they've done it, and you could certainly have other places that said, "Hey, you know, we don't care," or you know, you know, maybe they even prefer you don't be vaccinated. I mean, who knows? But the bottom line is, we would have a natural experiment in that case, and it would all be voluntary. And I think then most people would take their cues from how they see things unfold. Well, I think we can separate the fact that vaccinations individually are, are largely good. Right, mm-hmm. they've done lar- largely good, and individual vaccine has done largely good. You know, there's the outlier cases where people get harmed. My own son was was hurt by a vaccine. He was in the hospitalized for a few days, but we th- actually think it was a combination of vaccines, not a single vaccine. Mm-hmm. And you know, but we don't know. There's no way for us to actually know that, and that's part of the problem. Is mm-hmm. and so if you want to gain confidence in vaccine, forcing people under the threat of law to do that is actually the wrong way about it. You're actually creating their own resistance. So, well, and, and I think the argument is that uh, if you have people who are not vaccinated uh, that, that that actually basically undermines vaccines all, all, all together. So by having a society, I mean, it's almost like a wall and you have to have all everything there. And if you have a hole in the wall, it, it allows uh, viruses to then manipulate and overcome the vaccine because they can uh, change and evolve and that type of, type of stuff. I mean, uh, it, I mean, you guys think that that maybe it is from a certain perspective. I, I certainly see the argument there on, on why it should be mandatory because you can't have any holes. You know, well, sure, and, and what they essentially are arguing about is herd immunity is what the scientists are often referring to. And so if you have a certain percentage, it makes it very, very hard for the uh, disease to take a foothold. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's really what they're going for. But on the other hand, we have this issue of, you know, should you, <clears throat> should your body necessarily be uh, sacrificed up to the whole, and that's really what's happening if they're saying you have to inject something that you don't believe is good into your body. Mm-hmm. I don't find myself in that camp, but I can understand if somebody does feel that they don't want to have the vaccine. I, it's hard for me to see, you know, taking that needle and shoving it into them, which is essentially what we're doing with government. Well, part of the problem is also is we're having is 
there's a number of people who can't have vaccines for whatever reason, but you don't know until you've actually had a vaccine. And so much like my son, he, he, was, he was injured by vaccines, so we were very careful with the, remaining, with the following kids. One vaccine at a time, and none of them had any problems. And, and so by taking that kind of decision out of the hands of individuals and putting them in the hands of, of bureaucrats, is, it's extremely dangerous. Because right now, okay, we're all talking about measles vaccines, but in the future, what kind of vaccines are we talking about? The stuff they've given to armies, you know, the soldiers, the malaria shots that they forced on the soldiers, they're now having long-term health issues because of it. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of long-term issues that we just don't quite have the answers to. And whether I think people should have their vaccines, please go get your shots, but we shouldn't force people to go get vaccines. What if, it, what if the law was written like this, whereas uh, you're required to have a vaccine, but it's up uh, it's your discretion on which vaccines uh, were, were taken. Um, and, and, and as an encouragement, um, they would give you some kind of maybe tax break if you got your child vaccinated for everything uh, or something like that. They had it more of an encouragement, but they required that you have at least one vaccine of your choice. Do you think that would be a little bit more lenient or something like that? And, well, or you think that that still creates, creates the same problem or makes things worse? I think it, it's anytime you give the government or society the right to dictate what goes on, on inside your body, it's mm -hmm. a bad idea. You end up with the same thing like Alabama just passing a law essentially banning abortions. Mm -hmm. It's the same mindset that the society and, and has the right to tell you what's going on inside your body. It's just a fundamentally bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, vaccines can be, are, are good. You know, I don't like abortions, but I don't want them outlawed either. So it's, I don't have to agree with these positions to think that there's a larger underlying issue that needs to be talked about that we just don't. Well, here's the beautiful thing, too, about going the voluntary route. And if, you know, it, it essentially sets up a natural experiment. So, I mean, you know, if, if it becomes clear to most people that, look, these, this group of people got the vaccine and they're not having a problem and this other group of people didn't get the vaccine, then it's not an issue of force anymore. Most people will just voluntarily go and get that vaccine if, if but if it's not performing that way then hey they you know maybe they're justified in not taking it so. and we, there's even other solutions i'll even promote an unlibertarian solution and we should give out vaccines freely to anybody who wants one mm -hmm. okay well you know just go ahead anybody who steps in california who wants a vaccine can go up to walgreens and and get a and get a vaccine and and let the state of California pay for it. Uh, <laughs> now, now, you know, I can see you cringing. No, I, just, I don't <laughs> like that. No, I don't. No, but, yeah, but I, I see your, your point. Is, yeah, rather, rather than forcing and making an incentive. Right. Um, if you're going to. And that's why I, where I was getting at, well, maybe the tax break is, is uh, maybe require something uh, so that you took a measure to protect your, uh, your, you or your child from, uh, from diseases, uh, but still giving you the, the opportunity or, or the choose what. And I think the issue is with vaccines is, in my personal issue, is it's not so much the vaccine itself. I believe that everyone should be vaccinated, but the question is, at one point, it, uh, what if the, the pharmaceutical company screws up? You know, what if there's something that, that there's an error or, or something particularly wrong with the vaccine? You don't really have a choice on it. Uh, if a certain vaccine, I mean, what movie was that from? It was uh, I Am Legend. You guys ever see that one with mm -hmm. Will Smith in it? It was based yeah. off of a book, um, which actually had nothing to do i've read the book as well i had nothing to do with the book but uh <laughs> in the, the movie the movie's perspective what it was is it was a vaccine that created everyone i'm not saying that we're gonna create zombies or vampires from from a vaccine but you what if you end up having a vaccine that is or something that was originally intended for good made everyone get it and then we find out that uh you know months later that there's, there's a side effect that was unknown or something like that it was un, unexperimented you know what if that that happens or what if what, take it to a step further there was the uh uh, another movie, Equilibrium, uh, which is a very good libertarian movie, uh, where everyone's forced to, to take a, not a vaccine, but more of a, a um, emotional a pill that create that calms everyone's emotions, so that way they feel less or something like that. And if we start forcing how society behaves, we we uh, you know there could be things in these vaccines. It could be stuff that's that's making you know to eliminate testosterone. Everyone talks about you know toxic masculinity. You know you can have uh, some kind of vaccine that gets rid of that, <laughs> or that's mandatory. Yeah, or do you want someone like Donald Trump deciding what gets injected inside your body? He yeah. says it's a vaccine, but he lies all the time. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, but certainly, too, there's issues. You know, we've seen this in the public schools with uh, 
I guess, you know, uh, a lot of children being you know, diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, and then so they're put on, you know, a regimen of, of pills. Now, you can certainly imagine, you know, maybe at some point the government just says, well, we've determined that you uh, have this kind of character, and so we are going to, uh, you know, regulate the way you behave. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they, well, yeah, essentially we were yeah. doing that with this ADHD. And there, yeah. there was talk about uh, doing that with criminals a, a few years ago, I remember, uh, where they were talking about giving – people uh, like p pills that made them um, more calmer or something less violent or something like that. And there was another one that was, um, which I particularly don't want to de uh, defend uh, sex offenders, but it was one particularly designed for sex offenders to make it so they wouldn't re uh, repeat that. I mean, when you get get into the weeds of that, you know, definitely there could be a lot of other uh, issues that, that come with this. And that's and that's maybe my concern with, with vaccination. Uh, vaccination. Altogether, I, I'm in favor of science. I, you know, I, I, I I don't have a problem with GMOs. I don't have a problem with vaccines. I, I think uh, from a theoretical standpoint and from practical and what has been proven, they're good and we should should, uh, should be getting vaccinated. Uh, I don't, and I don't think that people should be worried about GMOs and those type of things. But there's this still doesn't mean that if the government is involved and then it's mandatory when there's a mistake, if, I'm, if I am ever wrong, then we're all screwed. <laughs> yeah, that, and, this, and, and the pharmaceutical companies, the vaccine companies, don't have any liability. The taxpayers actually have the liability from vaccines. And so that's, it becomes a whole dangerous issue. It's just, it's fundamentally dangerous. There was one point you made earlier, too, about potentially, uh, you know, providing everybody the vaccine for free. And one thing it does, if, if you know, as far as economics goes, you know, if you believe that there's some public goods that, uh, you know, government should handle, that does sort of meet the definition of a public good. So there is some, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's not like something, that. it's just, you know, it's a solution, not a particular solution I want. But you look at all the various solutions to this thing. Okay, well, that way we can solve most of the problem. Mm -hmm. Get everybody who wants vaccines, get them covered. Get every, And so you don't have to worry about them. And then you, the three, four percent who don't, they're past herd immunity, so you don't really have to care that much. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that's really just, you know, I think this really gives the government like almost a monopoly. And, you know, uh, um, when you have the government have a monopoly of, of violence, I mean, what, what other things do you think, guys think that uh, the government has, has kind of this, this vast control over that, you know, that doesn't allow people to really have a, a free market or free decision on? Any other ideas or or are things that you think should be a, that we should look into while we're at it? Well, the, the biggest one is always education. Is the, the government monopoly on education has prevented uh, education from evolving along with the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we still educate our kids the way we did 100 years ago. It's fundamentally backwards. And this is the problem with the monopoly, that lack of competition, you know, so that we can compare and test and see what works better. Instead, you know, you get a system that has a whole bunch of perverse incentives and, um, you know, but and it's not just that, too. I mean, you know, if you look at the way our garbage is picked up, I mean, that's also a monopoly. And you see everybody, you know, kind of scratches their head about why the prices keep going up. But there's really no alternative. You can't there's there's not a competitor that you can go to and say, hey, does somebody have a more well, efficient way of doing it? Let's back things? up on, on, on the education thing for a bit. I mean, what what is wrong with our education system? Is there things that, uh, that you guys can point out? Do you think that uh, is something that is addressed, or are you just saying that ge generically our education is just lousy and that we could have something better if we had our free market? Well, it, it functions both. You, generically, if we have a free market, you'd end up with you know better. You'd have some failures, but you know you'd also have some some improvements in some areas. But the system itself it feeds on itself. So only the people who succeeded in the system go back into the system and become teachers. And, mm -hmm. and so it has no corrective feedback loop because people like me who struggled through school or, or didn't thrive in that environment, we, there, we don't go back into the environment and say, here's what you need to do wrong. Here's where you need to focus on. So the only people who go back into those environments are the people who succeeded. And so you end up with a self-fulfilling feedback loop. So this worked for us. So we're going to do more of it. And I mean, then, we, we still have private colleges. And so I, I don't think that the, uh, our, our education is completely uh, gone. I think it's just from the, from the beginning, it, it's an issue. Um, from private colleges, it's a different perspective. Uh, personally, I, when, uh, when I was in, in middle school and high school, I was in special education. They, they thought I had a learning disability and everything. They didn't realize I was just lazy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so and they and they put me all these courses in in case so I wake. Uh, if, I remember they put me in a special class so I can learn how to become a manager at a, like a fast food place or something like that. It was designed for people who were not gonna ever gonna go to college or succeed in life, but you can at least make a living doing really well in some kind of service industry. 
so I barely graduated high school, but eventually I did uh, be- becoming employed at a major tech company, and, and I'm currently an engineer now. Uh, and then I did go to college, I, and I went to a private college, and I had a 4.0 all through college. Uh, so my co- college, uh, you know, grades were a lot better than, than my, my high school grades. I mean, <clears> I, was, uh, I was averaging like 1.6 for most of high school. <laughs> yeah, but, but you also did high, you did college willingly. You didn't, you didn't have someone forcing you to go to college. You mm-hmm. chose to do it. You, you took on that task willingly by yourself. And so that is a fundamental difference when you go to say, I want to go to this place. And other than this place is a torture, torture hell, I don't want to go to. I want to be at this place. I want to go learn these things because this is what I'm learning instead of having to go learn the algebraic equations that you never use, you know, 30 years later. I mean, I use them, but I'm an engineer. Well, yeah, but you're an engineer. <laughs> you know, and most of us, but even though most of us use, I mean, I was a machinist for a long time and you use algebra there, but you only use the small set, right? Mm-hmm. You don't go use the whole thing. You learn those, those handful of things you need to use and you use those over and over and over again. And now engineers are different. You guys have a much bigger set, but it's the same. It's the same principle. But the, the, the big problem, though, with the K through 12 is that you know the 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 incentives are all wrong. I mean, that's the the biggest part of it. I mean, you have this monopoly system. The incentives aren't tied to the student. You know, I mean, it's not like the teacher benefits based upon how well the students do. Mm-hmm. The teacher is for the most part, it's just getting paid the same, regardless how it, whatever product gets turned out. And the same thing with the school administration. And I think it, it's else. even an issue is uh, you can also have teachers that give, if because uh, I have heard of te- uh, certain teachers where they get, and this was more of an issue when I was in college, where teachers get in trouble if they fail too many students, so they end up just mm-hmm. giving everyone A's. Sure. I actually had a professor in college who, uh, if I didn't show up, for a test, I would still get a grade on my test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she, yeah. she would forge it in there just that way, and it should give me an A. It would give me like it should give me like a ninety-seven percent or something. It was something weird. I was like, I never even took the test. <laughs> just <show> up. Like, <laughs> well, when, this is where the benefit would be if we did have competition. Is that right now there's no metric driving output, but essentially, um, you know, if if you had competition, you know, eventually parents would see which schools the alumni are doing better from. Mm. And those are the schools then that would have more competition to get those spots. The prices would go up in those places, but that would also be a signal to other schools to change their behavior and to say, look, whatever we're doing here is not working. That's the way markets work. Unfortunately, we can't get markets in there because we have this government monopoly. And you know, that's the other funny thing about monopolies too, is that you know, people talk about monopolies and they see Mr. Monopoly and, you know, they think big business. But in reality, the only way a monopoly ever happens is if there's a government distortion. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's pretty hard to, to stop competitors uh, uh, without a government. So, yeah. Well, the other thing about, uh, about creating a market into schools is that you end up with have, having different people with different wants, needs, and desires exactly. could go to different, could go to different. If a child is an artist, they can go to a school that teaches dance and music or, or whatever. And if a child is an engineer, you can go to a, a school that teaches that. Well, that and I, kind of I, but I think that the, uh, um, the overwhelming concern in the, or the argument is that, uh, that when you have a difference in ed- education, so you, uh, you know, and, and this is what my, my history teacher had, had taught me. The reason why we learn history is not so much the, uh, so history doesn't repeat itself or anything like that, but it's that way you have uh, something in common with people that you've never met before. And, it, and so your education level kind of needs to be kind of unified. So in, in the future, when you come, become in the workforce, you know what everyone's competency is. Uh, that, that's kind of the argument that I've seen uh, for having a unified standard system. It doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be privatized, but I, I, I do see the argument for a unified system is to make sure that we, we are aware of where everyone's at. And you don't want uh, certain schools that teach that the earth is flat or something like that. Which could yeah. happen. But I mean, if I, from a libertarian perspective, you have to believe that if there was a school that had some bizarre curriculum that was teaching the earth is flat, their alumni would do very poorly and eventually they would just die out from competition. I mean, I, I don't think there was ever necessarily a law that told people they had to start believing the world was round. I think it was just people saw that wasn't wasn't a successful paradigm <laughs> believing that well and then we get to decide who gets to decide what's successful you know if someone believes mm-hmm. the world is flat but they live a perfectly happy life they pay their taxes their children don't don't hurt anybody and you know no, I, then I, it's I'm not, not trying I'm not trying to attack uh, people who believe in the earth is flat no I told uh, you can attack those they're, they're perfectly fine <laughs> attacking them but it, the point is they're allowed to exist and if that's if that's the the, what they want to promote in society, they have I, the right to do I, that. I see that they're allowed to exist, but we don't want that type of behavior to really manifest and stuff. And 
I, I guess here's what worries me though is that we have a standard right now and the standard is very low <laughs> this is this is what worries me i mean you see constant surveys of people who can't even tell you who are who are college or, or even just you know, K through 12 graduate, and they're not sure whether the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun. And so I, if you don't have such, just that basic level of understanding about the natural world around you, and you've had 13 years of this government standardized system, there's something wrong with the standard. I'd much rather see a competition-driven standard than an, a government edict-driven standard. I'd much rather see a local failure that fails a couple hundred students or a couple hundred families rather than a system-wide failure that failure. 350 million of us. I just, you know, I, I think a decentralized system decentralizes the failures. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, speaking of, of local things, um, uh, recently here in Sacramento, we had a, a crowd of uh, angry protesters protesting the sheriff's deputy, uh, South Sacramento, trying to clear out the uh, homeless encampment. Do you think that, that we could do better on that? What are you guys' thoughts? Personally, I, I think this is this is one of those very tough questions for uh, for libertarians because you have the issue of does a if, if a person has a right to exist, uh, then they have to have somewhere to exist. But we certainly wouldn't you know that would be an invasion of another person's private property rights if they mm -hmm. set up a tent on your mm -hmm. own lawn, and so certainly there's a problem there. So they tend to get pushed toward the uh, the commons, public commons spaces. But then we're all paying taxes to maintain those, and that, that wasn't the intent to necessarily just have some mm -hmm. refugee camp, you know, <laughs> in a lot of these places or in front of your library or your courthouse. So this is, this is one of those really tough questions for libertarians, and I think it goes back to, I don't, I'm not sure of what the systemic fix is for it today, but I think the long-term fix is the last issue we just talked about, you know, uh, you know fixing the uh, public education system, and I think at least we'll have a lot fewer uh, people with these problems. Well, I know that uh, when the sheriffs were, were clearing them out, and this this is at least from what I've what I understand, uh, they had they had actually offered free transportation to everyone, and they had a certain deadline to leave. It wasn't uh, like they went in there and removed them all. They basically let them all know that that they were going to be cleared out, and they had I think a few weeks or something to uh, gather their things, and they would get uh, buses, and they'd take them to certain places, they'd give them food and shelter and everything like that. But a lot of the people who were there, who were there didn't want to leave. It was they wanted to stay there, and that was the issue. It was that the sheriffs had to had to remove people who were not wanting uh, to leave. I know you live kind of close. Yeah, this is actually my neighborhood, so it's just down the street. And you got two questions. You got the homeless issue, and then you got why the neighborhood is angry. And those are actually two connected but separate issues. Why the neighborhood is angry is a long laundry list of, of reasons, from police mm -hmm. accountability, police abuse, to they want to open a homeless a homeless uh, shelter down the sh in, in the neighborhood, but they said it was in Curtis Park. It was near Curtis Park instead of Oak Park, and so, so they can pretend that they're putting it in a rich neighborhood rather than a poor neighborhood to make it look better. And uh, you know, so, it's, so there's a lot of underlying tension uh -huh. in the neighborhood of why an event like this may not have created such a, in other times, may not, in other neighborhoods, may not have had such an angry output, and, but in this particular neighborhood, you're dealing with a laundry list of issues. Um, the homeless camps, the reason the homeless people don't want to move is because their network, what, it, what network they have exists there. So if you take them out and you move them to the shelter in, in Arden, they have no, their, their friends, their connections mm -hmm. are, are, yeah, are all gone. I've been, I've been giving the same homeless man uh, my recycling for over a decade. He comes by every now and every few days and I give him my, recy my recycling cans for over a decade. So this is a long, ongoing problem. And there's, there is no simple solution. But we have to wonder, on Stockton Boulevard specifically, there's all these empty lots during this time of, of economic boom in housing markets, but there's no housing being built, there's no, there's no low income housing, no apartment buildings, mm -hmm. none of this stuff is being built in this neighborhood. And then here's, again, you've got the county and the city, it's kind of a weird pocket where that specific thing gets ignored because it's not part of the city, but it's part of the county, and it's a strange little pocket. So it, it's a... This particular issue is very complicated. Well, you might wonder, too, if there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing going on. If you're somebody with uh, money to invest and you drive into the neighborhood thinking, oh, I heard there's a vacant lot here, and then you see a bunch of tents on it, <laughs> you yeah. might not be too excited about investing. Well, it, 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 does, it does that, but there's, this neighborhood is so strange, which is why it's, it's really hard to talk about without knowing all the underlying inputs, mm -hmm. because we can't get a McDonald's or a 7-Eleven 
gets 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 rejected by the city council, but anything that the UC Davis Medical Center wants gets put in, you know, and they tell us, well, you can't have a McDonald's because of traffic, but we're going to put in this big, huge new development in the at the UC Davis Medical Center. It's that makes tons of sense. Yes, it, it you know, <laughs> it's, and so those are the kind of frustrations that this neighborhood is dealing with. A, a local a local um, church after 30 years just got closed down because of a permit patty. Calls the city, says we don't like the traffic, and the city finds out, hey, this thing is actually a, a res zoned residential. They're out of there, and they have already been moved. It happened so fast that the community didn't have a chance to. To, do, to respond. I think one thing that's really important too not to miss in this conversation is that you know this is not a local problem just to Sacramento. I mean this is a problem that a lot of places are dealing with and um, you know for anybody who's interested in looking into it more HUD publishes a, an annual report every year and I, I don't know if you can see it but but there's um, there's an annual report that they publish every every year mm -hmm. and you can just google it HUD, in a HUD homelessness annual report and they list the statistics for every state and I mean it's it's really staggering when you start to see where the homeless problems are I mean California is having a serious problem um, Seattle and Washington is having a serious problem uh, and surprisingly uh, the District of Columbia is this I think has a bigger problem than just about anybody oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. homelessness well it's all these places where the housing Prices are out of control. My little neighborhood at the edge of the ghetto is going for five hundred thousand dollars in little dinky houses. It's it's it's, yeah, I mean, it's I'm, crazy. I'm from the Bay Area uh, originally, from San Jose, and uh, and I, I still actually work kind of out of Santa Clara. Uh, I usually fly from from uh, Mayfair down to Santa Clara for work, uh, but I, I would never be able to live down there. Uh, it's just cheaper to fly and rent rent a hotel than it is to live down there because I mean, eight hundred thousand dollar house gets me in the ghetto. Yeah, uh, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky. Well, the That's sad thing is, too, you know, a lot of this stuff spurs, yet it's almost like a circular problem. There was a, a case just recently with a Home Depot in Oakland, and there was a homeless encampment right next door, and so they're starting to get a lot of crime happening, people breaking into their lots at night and stealing their supplies, and so Home Depot had to hire two police officers to guard their lot during the daytime, you know, two off-duty pay overtime, and that still wasn't solving the problem. So Home Depot's saying, well, we may be leaving Oakland, and it's just, uh, you know, you know, then then you have yet another vacant lot <laughs> and yeah, less and it, jobs. And, and it's, it's a, it, but it all starts from the fact yeah. that our cost of living is so outrageous mm -hmm. that there's really nothing people on the lower end of the economic scale can do. They're victims of, now, of what's going on around In uh, Ella County, which is the uh, county where I live, I live in Cameron Park, um, I, I, and I've just found out about this recently. I don't really know a whole lot about it, but I, I suppose we have like a, a what's called a homeless police or something like that. I don't know the, the official name, but they came out with something where it's the, the law enforcement will actually visit the homeless. They don't actually arrest them or anything like that. They visit them as almost like a welfare check. Uh, and then make sure that they get food and resources. Do you think maybe that will be a good solution to handle this, or do you think that just doesn't do, do jack shit? Well, you, you gotta try something, right? Until you find out it's better than nothing. It's San Francisco's doing a poop patrol. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a hard question and there's no easy answers. I, I think it's best we can come up with that. Yeah, all right. That's it for the show. Thank you for watching the Chain Counterpoint.